world-renowned bands, especially Van Halen, and you're listening to Dave and Dave Unchained. Pick up the new coffee table-sized book, The Decade That Rocked, by legendary rock photographer Mark Weissguy Weiss. This 376-page book has hundreds and hundreds of full-color photos that Weiss shot through the 80s for magazines like Circus, Faces, and Hit Parader, featuring bands like Van Halen, Motley Crue, Twisted Sister, Bon Jovi, Skid Row, Guns N' Roses, Ozzy Osbourne, and more. There's even behind-the-scenes stories to go with these colorful, eye-popping pictures. The Decade That Rocked, a new book by rock photographer Mark Weiss, is available for purchase now. Go to thedecadethatrocked.com, where there are exclusive bundles available with extra prints, t-shirts, and even patches. Inquire about the Van Halen bundle, especially made for Dave and Dave Unchained listeners. Order today. The Decade That Rocked. It'll rock your world. Is our culture is Geraldo Rivera is news, Hillary is a politician, and McDonald's is breakfast, okay? So you right. think that a $35 pot bus for $10 worth of throwaway Jamaican bunk reefer. <laughs> no, seriously, seriously, dig this now. Most people aren't aware, this is a $35 traffic citation. It literally right. says Buick, Chevy, other. Okay. <laughs> and you were other. And under other, I should have wrote Lady Die, because I rode in, walked in the back of the precinct six, you know, Dave Roth, I walked out the front, lady died, hey, Mr. Roth, you make a cup of, you know, <laughs> doing the paparazzi and everything. Well, the upside of it is, is there was a certain group of people around the world who were starting to call me Mr. Roth. That evaporated. Right, that evaporated immediately. That evaporated. Now, when I walked down the street, it's, hey, Dave, 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 <laughs> What's happening? All right, Dave, you know what time it is. But a Dave, he don't want me around. He says he's tired of watching me let him down. He just wants a good mail back. He wants only the best. But he hates disappointment better than all the rest. And he says that he thinks that I'm headed for a whole lot of trouble. Well, he thinks that I'm headed for a whole lot of trouble. Well, he thinks that I'm headed for a whole lot of trouble if I don't nail the mailbag in trolls. That's right, it's mailbag time again. And we got a nice sack, and boy, we got a heater right out the front, Dave. Number one comes from Dan Ninen, and he's on fire, I'm going to warn you. He says, I wanted to start off by saying that, like his father, Wolfgang is one of the most talented musicians ever to have walked the face of this earth. In fact, probably more talented than his father. He's also a great singer. It's so wonderful to see him on the three tours, and he was awesome. And he comes across as a super nice guy. However, I listened to his new album three times, and I have to say I'm very disappointed in the songwriting. There isn't one memorable chorus on the whole album. Listen to any Van Halen song, and you'll hear a memorable hook repeated over and over again. How many times do you hear You Really Got Me or Running With The Devil in those songs? I worked in the record business back in the day, and a and person told me you should be able to know what the chorus of the song is after listening to it once or twice maximum. I can't remember a single chorus from the Mammoth album. The songwriting is too complex, and there are too many parts, in many cases, where you expect to hear a chorus. Instead, another B section pops up. Wolfgang said he wanted his music to be nothing like Van Halen, and boy, he has succeeded. Dan Ninen. Well, Dan, I want to say that I appreciate you as a listener for this podcast, and I've always enjoyed your letters. However, you are dead wrong, pal. This album has tons of memorable choruses. I'm shocked that you don't like it. I gotta be honest. Too complex? What is is this, a Rush album? I really suggest that you open your mind a little bit and give it another chance, Dave. What do you think? Well, he's certainly entitled to his opinion. I do think it's a good album. I do think there's some catchy stuff there. Not everything needs to be verse, chorus, verse, chorus, verse, chorus to be a good song. I mean, he's certainly entitled to his opinion. Sorry he doesn't like it, but we do appreciate him as a listener, so thank you for that, and we appreciate your opinion. 
Absolutely. Number two comes from Mario Pass, and he says, Looking back through the lens of a darker time, what would you say was the saddest and most pragmatic song that has a newfound poignance since Ed passed? To me, it's Can't Get This Stuff No More, and I think it's got arguably the very highest note Dave will ever hit on tape. Mario Pass. Well, Mario, to be honest, and I know some people are going to be shocked by this. I did say this before on the podcast, but I think it's How Many Say I. I was never a fan of that song, but after Ed's passing, I heard it, and it really started to catch on with me, and I listened to it over and over, and I think it has sort of a new meaning for me, and I think it kind of really blew me away. It was a very intimate performance, and very ballsy, for sure, and kind of dark, but I just thought for some reason, especially the way Eddie has that gravelly, kind of gruff voice, he sounds like he's exhausted at the end of the record i don't know there's something about that there's a lot of emotion in that particular recording and i I really enjoyed that believe it or not more now so what about you dave well i do agree that can't get this stuff no more is a poignant song in respect to ed's passing another sad van halen song that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with Ed's passing, but I always thought was a grim subject matter was Mean Street. After Dave had went on one of his trips and, you know, saw like kids living on the street and stuff like that. So that's really, you know, not a stereotypical go happy, lucky song that Van Halen was known for. Right. That's true. Letter number three comes from Minka Head. Dave, and he says, what's up, broskies? I just happened to be going through my collection and came across a 1980. 84 Korean LP, which is a Korean version of the Van Halen album, 1984. While checking this out, I noticed two great big details missing. Number one, the artwork has been tampered with. There's no cigarettes. And the other, there's no hot for teacher on side two. Have you guys ever seen or heard of this album or have any other info on it? I'm also wondering what your thoughts or opinions are on act one. Ciao, baby. Mink ahead. Yes, there's certain cultures that have elements that are taboo like for example the cigarettes on the cover there are taboo so that was removed the song hot for teacher obviously the subject matter taboo that was removed if you remember when we did the balance special and we interviewed designer glenn wexler they had a different cover for balance because of the Siamese twins on the cover that caused an issue and that's episode 51 this happens and the covers will be altered in order to facilitate sales in that country I have seen that before and especially with Van Halen with balance what do you think Dave I remember we spoke about this in our interview with Margot Neha yeah we did that's right the artist who did the album cover for 1984 Mm -hmm. because we actually dug up a picture of that and she was like wow I don't think I she, even know knew. That, right? she didn't even I mean, know, right? She had no idea it had been tampered with. Yeah, but it's just what, you know, certain cultures are going to allow or, or not allow. And it's like, well, what do you do? Do you not have the album sold or do you suck it up and change whatever you need to change in order to do that? And that's what they did. They took that cigarette right out of the baby's hand. And you can find that album now. It's, it's uh, somewhat of a collector's item. That's true. Letter number four comes from Cactus Pete Martins. And he says, Hey, Dave and Dave, listen to your latest podcast, and you mentioned Elvis made a great sounding album. Check out Alter Bridges' albums as well, and Tremonti, Mark Tremonti's solo albums. Elvis produced those. I think the connection was Wolf was friends with Mark and played bass on the first Tremonti album, and it must have met Elvis that way. All of the albums sound awesome, and Wolf's is no exception. It's on daily rotation, and my kids love it too. Hope to see him open up for GNR in Phoenix on the 30th of August. Love the podcast, Cactus Pete Martins. Well, Pete, yes, Wolf confirmed that in one of his recent interviews in Classic Rock that he met Elvis from Mark Tremonti. He also got the GNR opening act gig because Elvis produced Slash's solo album. So I think there was the connection for that. So that's for sure. Dave, what do you think? I think you're right. I think that's where the connection comes from. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Letter number five comes from Thomas Howell and he notes that I am not actor C. Thomas Howell but a CPA and I'm waiting on Quiet Dave to start an Accountants for Van Halen club. (laughs) 
Doesn't that sound exciting? <laughs> it will be riveting. <laughs> that's right, that's right. And he says, last month you both suggested recordings of live CDs from Van Halen eras that are good for workouts. Now, another question for you. If you were to re-listen to any of the previous Dave and Dave podcasts, what are your top five I should consider? Looking back, my favorite has been the making of a different kind of truth. Thanks for all you do, Thomas Howell. Well, Thomas, they are all masterpieces, let's be honest. And God damn it, you should listen to them all. But if I were to give you a handful, probably a little more than five, but a handful of ones to check out, I'd say episode 43 with Bart Walsh. That was fantastic. I really enjoyed that. Episode 34, which is the special on your filthy little mouth. Very, very cool. We had not only Terry Kilgore, the guitarist, on the album, but also Niall Rogers, who produced the album on there as well. And episode 25, the 5150 Vault, that was a really interesting episode with Andrew Bennett. And episode 22, Sammy Hagar's 70th birthday. That's a big one. We have an interview with Sam on there. And now episode 15, definitely got to include this one. This is the first appearance of Noel Monk. And my God, if you have not experienced that, that is Mr. Toad's Wild Ride in 90 Minutes. That's really fun. Episode 11 of The Different Kind of Truth with John Shanks. And I mentioned that. And also episode 49, of course, when Dave and I go to Vegas and we have a whole trip on Roth. Dave, any particular ones? That stand out for you? Anything with Noel is always entertaining. <laughs> it's gold. So it's gold. <laughs> that that's good. And speaking of entertaining, the interview we did with Stuttering John Melendez. Oh, that's uh, right. You love that one, yeah. <laughs> I do. That was just so fun and hysterical. That was the like, one on, just, yeah. yeah. That just went off the rails. I would say um, interviews with Billy Sheehan are always informative oh, yeah, and good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Billy has a really great memory and, and shares a lot of good stuff. You know, the one with Andrew Bennett, I know there are a lot of people who give Andrew a lot of crap quite frankly, for the book he's selling and the DVD set he had tried to sell in the past. And everybody's welcome to their opinion on that. And I don't necessarily disagree with that. But putting all that aside, the stories he tells are really very interesting. Yep, that's for sure. If you could put your feelings aside on him and and whether he should have put out the book or not and whatever, but he was there during important points in the band's history, and it's really very interesting to hear what went down while he was there. So that was always good to hear and tell stories from that. Absolutely. Letter number six comes from Daz from Oz, is Darren Leach. He says, I'm writing this on June 17th. I was reminded that the Fuck album was released on June 17th in 1991. Happy 30th. I still remember talking about this album with a classmate when I was still in school in Australia and he had just bought the cassette. I hadn't listened to the album in a long time and I have to say it sounds great. It's sounding very full. Much more full than the thin sounding OU812. Alex's drumming is just phenomenal and I'm glad I can actually hear Michael Anthony's bass. They also moved away from keyboards and synth on this album which I found interesting. Do you remember buying it at the time? Do you think it would have sold well if it had been released after the grunge explosion, which hit a few months later, where does it rank in your VH albums? Keep up the great work. Daz from Oz, Darren Leach. Well, I can tell you that I remember Daz buying it on day one in the long box format. Dave, remember the long box format for the CDs? I do. Yeah. And I remember, yep. I have to say, I remember being disappointed in the cover. I thought it was very unimaginative and lazy. I also felt that they printed it way too dark. Somebody really fucked up with the cover. I mean, it is so dark, you can't even read the writing on the cover. They ended up fixing it years later and lightening it up. But I instantly loved the album. I thought it was sonically miles above OU812, and I thought it was a really well-crafted album. It's my favorite Van Hagar album, for sure. We talk about that when we talked about the album in one of our episodes. It totally benefited being released four months before Nirvana's Nevermind, that's for sure. But I still think it would have been successful. Where does it rank in my Van Halen albums? It's definitely my favorite Van Hagar album, but... Overall, I think it ranks number eight for me. What about you? 
As far as the ranking goes, yeah, it's about that for me, too. On any given day, my favorite Van Hagar album is either For Unlawful Carnal Knowledge or 5150. I flip-flop constantly. Okay. I do think the album would have done just as well if it had been released later on in the grunge era because Van Halen was on fire and, and superseded all that. That's true. They had number one albums with Sam 